There is a disease that exists within our kingdom that is absolutely one that just horrifies me to my core. And by kingdom, I mean animal kingdom. You take something like an amoeba, right? Which is a parasite that can eat your brain. There is experimental medicines that, you know, could potentially save your life. Let's say you have a virus that rapidly moves through a population. Well, depending on your body's ability to detect and destroy it, along with certain medications to prevent the virus from replicating, you have the ability to fight it. What's that? You got frisky with some girl and you believe the online memes that, uh... Doing stuff has now introduced your upper digestive tract to the effects of foreign bodies such as E. coli, which for the love of God, that is holy. Why, God? Well, luckily for you, there are now antibiotics that can mitigate the effects of that bacteria saving your life. Humanity has begun conquering diseases around us, or at least has the idea of how to ease the suffering associated with them. But one disease we aren't even close to cracking. A pathogen so horrible, it doesn't exist to reproduce or spread its influence or even to survive. It just simply exists because of quite literally the laws of the universe. It exists simply because of forces observed day to day. We have nothing that can prevent it, treat it, or slow it down, or even ease the decay of those who contract it. I am, of course, talking about prions. And believe me, I don't get to talk about prions all that often, so you better believe we're going to get into some horrific discussion about the pathogenesis of this protein today. But in the meantime, there is a reason that I bring this up. The year is 2009. It was a strange era where everything had to be zombies. Every game had to have some form of zombies. Tons of zombie movies. No idea why, if I remember correctly, because I'm an old man, but I think maybe it had something to do with COD zombies coming out, which continued to fuel the fire concerning more zombie paraphernalia coming out, which then resulted in today's topic. Zombieland and Zombieland Double Tap, which arguably, that one was kind of a nightmare to watch. I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't bad on its own, but 10 years later, after the craze had already passed, and many, many, like, subplots that seemingly had no conclusion. As the adolescents say, mid at best. But in the not-so-distant past, humanity would be besieged by a disease that has already reared its ugly head before. In fact, the food that humans would eat at fast food joints, this cheap, easy-to-make protein that was very easy to also distribute, and I guess I should use the word food loosely here, these burgers would be infected by this misshapen protein as the first person to eat it would quickly become infected. However, it wasn't just one person, but because the amount of people consuming it, the infection would spread far and wide as people began turning on those they once knew. Seemingly, the entire world would be tainted with this infection. But how exactly does this happen, and what concerning neurology and physiology in general does the body struggle with? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. Spring is officially upon us. You can tell by all the tornadoes coming through my state currently. Isn't nature wonderful? And because spring is here, you're going to need nutritious and delicious meals for the warmer, more active days ahead. With these ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door, you can check meal prep off of your list. Look, humans are visual creatures, and because of that, we all want to look our best for the coming summer months. I get it. It's vanity, but it's a real thing. With these meals, you can consume calorie-smart choices to keep your caloric intake in check. And considering these meals are always fresh, never frozen, it's also just delicious to do so. Looking to bulk up? Their protein options help you build muscle as well. They have keto, vegetarian, vegan. All of these are available. And I'm not just some dude telling you to order this and not do it myself. In fact, I've been so impressed with Factor that I've been ordering consistently since January and committing to replacing my lunches with them, putting me in the necessary caloric deficit along with exercise. And I've actually dropped like 19 pounds since January 3rd. And if that's not enough to sell you on it, they are also offering awesome gourmet meals with premium produce such as broccoli and broccolini that would perfectly complement any protein source that you choose. So if all that sounds good to you, then by heading to factor75.com or clicking the link below and using code Roanoke50, you can get 50% off your first Factor box today. All right, let's get back to it. So we kick off our story with quite possibly the best intro of all time. If you don't love Metallica playing For Whom the Bell Tolls to the slow movement of people being attacked by zombies, then you just have not reached true enlightenment, and I'm sorry, but there's like no saving you. But we have some new information on how the entire country has become Zombieland. There are barely any survivors left with what Columbus thinks. The form of gooberments are done. Columbus also has a list of rules. Number one being cardio, which is probably why it spread so fast in the US. The next is some advice that I think everyone knows at this point to Double Tap, which coincidentally uh, will be the next movie we cover after this, Joy Abound. And we now head into the aforementioned excellent intro, which uh, some of this will definitely have to be blurred, but moving on. As we head to Garland, Texas, which is hilarious because I live in Georgia, and most of this thing actually appears to have been filmed here. This is actually LaGrange, Georgia. I know that gas station. 
Actually, some of this was filmed in my hometown where I have lived just down the road when I was a kid. So obviously, I'll have to nerd out about that fact, uh, as I know where everything is. Anywho, Columbus has stopped at the gas and goal. After being attacked by a group and outrunning them because of his cardio ability, he ends up crashing his car after one was actually in his car. He gets out and then double taps it and you have to ask, where were the other two that were just chasing him? So now we get some backstory. He's going from Austin, Texas to the real apocalypse zone known as Columbus, Ohio. As he walks along, he meets another man who rolls up who will affectionately be known as Tallahassee. They have a standoff for a moment as Columbus gives the international symbol for hitchhiking. They talk about where they're headed as Tallahassee agrees to take Columbus as far as Texarkana. As they drive along, we will get to the zombies soon enough, but they stop to check out a hostess truck where they find a bunch of snowballs, which are actually pretty good when I used to eat them. As they continue on their journey, as Columbus then stops off to take the Browns to the Super Bowl, we get even more backstory. My man here was playing World of Warcraft in its prime. In fact, I still need to go back as a paladin and backhand the Lich King sometime soon. But as he was raiding with his bros, his neighbor shows up to ruin raid night. She talks about how a homeless guy attacked her and bit her, which is pretty normal for Austin, Texas, which then spreads the infection as we will come to find out. He's had the hots for her for a while, so she falls asleep on his couch, but then he wakes up and she begins to attack him. Turning into a massive game of keep away, he manages to elude her before taking her out with a toilet cover, which kicks off the whole escape plan. Here we get actual confirmation, which having worked with diseases, bro, they botched the explanation here. It was pretty bad. But then again, remember that like era when all zombie movies were like, oh yeah, it's a bacterial infection, but it's actually a virus. They did the same thing here. Mad Cow became Mad Human became Mad Zombie. It was a fast-acting virus that left you with a swollen brain and a raging fever as well as a taste for who flesh. Wait, that's the Grinch. Never mind. A taste for human flesh. Mad Cow, however, was not a virus, but in fact a prion disease, which is a misshapen protein that your body cannot destroy, but it's way more horrifying than that, which we will get to in the science portion of this episode. Just know it's not a virus. Also, for everybody still watching that may be new to this channel, I do cover summaries, but then the last, like, Second half of the video is always about science. I had somebody who was like, oh, I just thought you were doing like a lame recap, which thanks for that. But no, it's a science-based thing. It's just maybe people haven't seen the movie that I've seen, so I cover it for them. Anyways, driving along, they spot that really it doesn't matter where you are, the infection is everywhere. They discuss where they are really headed because there is no place that's going to be untouched by this. Heading to Blaine's grocery store, which I'm fairly certain is North Georgia near Blairsville. I'm assuming at this point, we are like in the first year of the infection process, given how the grocery stores hadn't really been raided completely as of yet. But as they walk through, a woman then exits out the back. The younger sister has apparently gotten bitten. They hand over the old pellet thrower to Wichita, which then, you know, she's supposed to take out Little Rock, but instead of doing that, they just end up robbing them. <laughs> I mean, survival is important. So then Tallahassee and Columbus are now walking. Interestingly, Little Rock then talks about how she almost passed for a zombie, which in the movie Maggie, she becomes a zombie. All right, nerd out time. So, it's my hometown, actually right here. This is Noonan Square. It basically looks like this all the time. As they walk through, it's kind of surreal, because if you look in the back, you can see Bank of Coweta uh, in front of the tank. Not the worst bank in the world, but I do have my beefs with them. Stepmother actually used to work for them. Ugh. Tallahassee breaks a minivan as they then head to the surrounding residential area. And I know it doesn't look like much, but that's just Georgia in late fall. Everything kind of is gloomy at that point. Tallahassee then finds a Hummer with a bag of force multipliers in the back, and thanks God for rednecks, which correct, I'm a firm believer in stay strapped or get clapped, and that's exactly what you will find in the surrounding neighborhoods. Tallahassee begins talking about his puppy named Buck. He's just on basically a tour of fun after losing a loved one. But as they continue along and they find a Cadillac from earlier that was stolen, Tallahassee then goes to check it out and finds that it's empty as he signals to Columbus to drive down. As he gets in the Hummer, well, they've already taken over Columbus for the second time, but this time Wichita and Little Rock take them along, considering, I mean, again, uh, you know, they had already gotten robbed twice, so kind of like a double jeopardy thing. But apparently they also used to take advantage of people who were interested in Wichita, so it's unsurprising that they were able to overcome Columbus and Tallahassee. So, everyone then pulls a force multiplier on one another as Columbus calms them down. Apparently these two are headed west for quite possibly one of the most horrible ideas I've ever heard of, they are heading to a highly populated area with a massive population density to go to a place called Pacific Playland. Wichita basically tells Columbus everyone in this town, or everyone in his town, is already turned into zombies, which sort of bumps him out, because that means his family's gone. But later that night, they then find a car for Columbus to, you know, take and then go home. But considering he has nowhere else to go, he decides to just stick with a hot chick and the guy and a youngling who actually know how to fight zombies. Probably some good thinking. 
driving through what I can only assume is the Southwest, but actually probably just South Georgia because the state has like 20 different geologies and climates, they destroy a place for funsies. We also get even more words of wisdom from Tallahassee. Don't worry about the blind spots. Blind spots are for other drivers. So is that how it works? So they finally then make it to California, which is hilarious because if you pay attention, this is the same road they drove down earlier when leaving Noonan, right before meeting up with Wichita and Little Rock. And they thought I wouldn't notice. Too bad they didn't realize I'm an absolute nerd for this stuff. Entering a city, which seems like literally the worst idea I've ever seen in my life, they stop and grab a map, which also seems incredibly risky. Heading to Hollywood Hills, I mean, I guess it is, I have no idea, I've never been there. They then head to a house with BM on the gate. Heading inside, my God, it's Bill Murray's home. As they check it out and then make sure he's not infected, they find a movie theater. But someone else is in the home. As Bill walks in, Wichita hits Billy Boy with a golf club, where then they get some more interesting information. So, makeup helps him blend in with other zombies, which indicates that this is not a scent-based thing, but just a visual thing, which seems like it would make it rather easy to survive this if you could pretend like you're infected. But that'll change in the second movie. Anyhow, they proceed to smoke tobacco leaves, it is tobacco. <laughs> I will take no more questions, but then they have this awesome idea because they were smoking tobacco to sneak up on heavily armed survivors. Brilliant. So as Bill goes in, Columbus then puts a shot into his sternum only to realize he's not actually a zombie. So then Bill passes after a really long breath and they throw him off the balcony and waste a ton of ammo and alert every infected within a few mile radius that they are there. Later that night, for some reason, the power of the house is still working, which is surprising. Tallahassee then goes to talk about Buck, which was actually his son, as he shows the group that he and his son made, which was a duct tape wallet. God, do you remember those? Anyways, later on, Tallahassee then teaches Little Rock how to properly aim a handheld, as she reacts as the typical pre-adult age would act, kind of just rolling their eyes and breathing out heavily because they're angry about life. Columbus and Wichita then go have some wine together, which then somehow serves as a catalyst for, Ree, I need to leave because I'm getting too close. Anyways, Columbus gets angry at Tallahassee for being a giant, fun-blocking robot developed in a lab or something, which his timing was impeccable to ruin Columbus's chances of engaging in the horizontal tango. So, getting to Pacific Playland. Well, this seems like a horrible idea, probably because it is. They head in while Columbus and Tallahassee start discussing parting ways so that Tallahassee can go find a Twinkie. Meanwhile, at Playland, Wichita turns on the power of the place, not only making a ton of noise, but literally turns on everything. Gee, I wonder if that'll alert the horde. And alert the horde it does. As they enjoy their rides, the infected start jumping over fences. And at this point, Columbus decides to go after Wichita as the siege of the theme park continues. Running back to the car, they bail out of the car. Can't say I would have done the same thing, but all right. So now it turns into a giant game of keep away. Tallahassee tells Columbus that, you know, that'll do pig as Columbus immediately crashes his bike and Tallahassee then realizes that he's probably gonna die without him. So he agrees to go help him and then go after the other two. They think, like, on the ride, they corner themselves on a ride that drops, right? Very good. So as it descends to the horde below, uh, they're able to take out the control box, which stops it from, you know, letting them get torn apart from the infected below and being stuck in their seats. Arriving on scene, they realize that maybe these two do require their assistance, which sends Tallahassee on a spree. Shouting to Columbus, they call him uh, Ohio for some reason. I think this may have just been a mess up in the movie. I have no idea. But Tallahassee then runs off drawing the infected. Thus ensues a massive fight scene where one infected, like when they go in the scare house, literally gets stuck in the mouth of the hydraulic press of like what is essentially a T-Rex, which seems like a massive safety hazard for anyone who is just like casually visiting. At this point, Tallahassee then locks himself in a shed and continues taking out the infected as each individual has to deal with their own infected until Columbus finally comes face to face with his own phobia, a clown. Which, judging by the state of the world today, aren't we all clowns? Anyways, overcoming his fear, he ends up taking it out, which then, uh, you know, Wichita gets all hot and bothered by that, and then tells him her real name, which is my ex-girlfriend's name, good luck bro, which I suppose is just a first name, so her real name is Kristen. Anyways, as he then brushes her hair over her ear, and then they go, like, she, she says, we gotta go find Florida. Why does she keep calling them by the states? It's not their actual name, like... I, this, this had to have been a mess up. Anyways, Columbus then takes out a Twinkie box to which Little Rock saved a Twinkie for Tallahassee. Ah, all's well that ends well. Except not really because now we head into the major downgrade. I know, I'm in as much pain as you about this. And I mean, normally I would say the sequel isn't important, but in this case, it actually shows there is a progression of the disease, which we still need to know when we discuss the pathophysiology. So here we go. I'm warning you, put a helmet on. 
We start off with the movie actually acknowledging it's been about 3,000 years since the last movie. The infected have now begun evolving into different variants of infected. It appears that eventually the body would reach a form of homeostasis, utilizing the prions, which, I mean, I suppose it should basically do as long as you're surviving, but this has had some beneficial and also some detrimental effects on the body. The first one is known as a homer. A homer is incredibly dumb. The brain appears to have been heavily affected by the infection to the point that it will make them largely unobservant as well as clumsy, indicating that likely there is an issue with the cerebellum controlling coordination of the limbs. The second variant is known as the hawking. This particular type of infected appears to have arisen from someone who was already quite intelligent in their uninfected life and managed to retain some of that intellectual integrity. While not overly strong, they can problem solve to near human levels, meaning more planning would be needed to be involved in dealing with these particular infected. The third variant is a much more dangerous form than the others, affectionately known as the ninja. They choose to stalk the uninfected rather than just outright confronting them in the open. This has led to people getting quickly overwhelmed in small spaces and either being infected or being eaten by the infected. Either way, not ideal. There is a fourth variant, but we aren't there yet, so moving on. We meet up with Columbus, Tallahassee, Little Rock, and Wichita, and more Metallica, because we didn't need anything else, of course. You can't hear it because Metallica has a history of destroying those who use their music through copyright, but the group is taking the White House at this point. Taking over the White House, everyone just continues to sort of age as the slow, crushing reality of time passing sets in. Little Rock at this point is attempting to find a dude, and yeah, that's the basis of the whole movie. Oh, God. Every morning, it's Christmas morning. And now that they're safe in this safe area, Tallahassee gives Little Rock a force multiplier from the king, also known as Elvis Presley, which I have an interesting fact about that. First, I went to school with Elvis's grandniece, I believe it was. And second, since I live in that area that I do, I actually ended up almost buying their house when they were selling it back at the tail end of 2021. Uh, it's actually a really small world out there. So later on, Columbus and Wichita share a moment that then goes horribly wrong that old Papa Roanoke is gonna give you some advice. If you ask a woman to marry you and she says no, like 95% of the time, it's time to head to the bar and then meet someone new because it ain't likely to change. Anyways, Columbus gets blown out of the sky because there's no therapist to help people get past their hangups. And also, how is there still power here? Well, I do suppose it is the White House, so maybe that's why. But as Columbus walks through, Tallahassee is standing there menacingly. He tells Columbus that he has bad news. Apparently, Wichita and Little Rock bailed again. Like, I get the first time, right? I mean, they didn't really know each other, and uh, they had just met, but it's been like 10 years at this point. It seems a little odd to be bailing out right now. And worst of all, they took the beast. So we jump over to Wichita, talking about how annoying having a boyfriend is, and then they come up on a hippie standing in the middle of the road. Fast forward a few weeks, and Columbus is taking it pretty hard. As they go through the mall on segways, they then just start taking out infected, as Columbus then heads to the candle shop, because Zombieland smells terrible. As he does, a random woman just shows up there, and that also looks like my other ex-girlfriend. I'll tell you, a whole lot of this movie is weirdly nostalgic. So then they hit it off and then go back to the White House, and there's nothing like a rebound. Tallahassee then at this point tells Columbus that the next day he's going to head out because he's salty about Little Rock leaving. Then as soon as they get to the other room, it's literally a college frat party in July. Great times. Tallahassee then hears something, so he and Columbus both go check it out. Heading into the garage, Wichita has come back. Apparently Little Rock has gone missing, so she came back for supplies. She mentions how they picked up a guy from Berkeley, and then Tallahassee is livid that she's dating a musician who's a pacifist as well. Agreed. I don't think you can be a pacifist in Zombieland. Wichita then literally nopes out from the cringe that was happening, which then gave Little Rock the chance to leave. So then Little Rock apparently also noped out because she's like totally in love, you guys. So... 75% of the squad is back together now. Wichita then informs them that there's a new type of infected out there that's way stronger and more resilient than normal. So as they discuss that, old Candle Girl comes down and barges into the moment. But hey, Columbus was a free agent at this point, so can you really blame him or get that mad? The next morning, they then head out in the minivan as they need to take it to Graceland to get Little Rock back because apparently that's where she was headed. Truly, it feels like a freaking soccer mom moment. And while they get ready to go, Madison then shows up and they leave all of her stuff behind, which will probably be important later. Jumping over to Little Rock and the musician whose literal name is Berkeley, which is hilarious, the rest of the crew then stops off to scoop up an RV, which will be way better traveling arrangements. Heading down off the bridge, they then approach the RV as Madison then goes to open the door, but an alarm goes off, alerting the infected in the area. Columbus climbs up, telling everyone where the infected are running from, quite effective at taking them down, as one then starts climbing up. 
It's a homer though, so they ignore it, but then a Hawking has climbed up and it basically gets got after jumping after Columbus. As they look out and see another one, they then open up on him, but the rounds don't seem to be doing much. They call it a T-800 as it keeps getting up. Stronger, deadlier, and harder to kill, which requires the non uppled tap, which is, you know, more than the double tap. It's actually nine of them, and it actually brings it down finally. These require headshots to basically put it out of its misery. Heading into the RV, I'm required by law to tell you uh, that gas in no way, shape, or form would be functional at this point. All the injectors would be clogged, because as water and lighter hydrocarbons evaporate out of the fuel, it basically turns to varnish. With fuel stabilizers, you can get about a year and a half of good fuel, but within a typically about six months, fuel destabilizes. So like the densest part that's left over won't really burn, but it will definitely wreck your engine if you aren't careful. And I say that because one guy is gonna tell me in the comments that he had fuel in his garage for two years and it totally still worked. Yeah, it's not like putting water in the gas tank, but it's horrible for your engine. And then I would tell you, try using 10 year old fuel and let me know how that works. As they then take off with the magic fuel that immediately uh, works for them, they then hit spikes that prevent theft as they head back to the minivan, meaning this whole thing was a waste of time. However, it did make them aware of the T-800s. So as the ride continues, Madison starts talking about Uber, but in this timeline, it doesn't make any sense. And as she talks, she burps and appears to be suffering from some sort of ailment. They pull over as they think she's infected. She starts throwing up as the group discusses who wants to take her out. And part of the group appears to be gleeful about that. Columbus then follows her into the woods as Madison takes off, but Columbus apparently puts her down and then heads back to the car. They then head out and continue their trek to Memphis. Later that night, they wake Tallahassee up as they pull up, but they don't see the Beast or Little Rock, and Graceland is just pretty much a destroyed house. They continue on as they found one place that's still up and running and then spot the beast parked out front. So Little Rock must be there. Tallahassee goes and puts on Elvis's shoes or at least tries to, but they don't fit. However, they do fit Columbus very well. As Tallahassee then sits down to play the piano, which again, this place has not been cleared. Seems like a bad idea to turn your back on anything. Wichita goes to try to find Little Rock. A woman named Nevada then shows up and smacks Tallahassee in the face. And this results in a standoff as Nevada tells them Little Rock ran off with Berkeley a few days ago, leaving the car behind. That's a really bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Nevada then goes on to say that she almost murdered them. Nevada then goes on to say that Berkeley wouldn't shut up and said that they were headed to a place called Babylon. And as we see it, there is just leading a horde of infected there as well. Tallahassee and Nevada then hit it off pretty much immediately due to their mutual love of Elvis, of course, and Little Rock and Berkeley then head to Babylon. There are no force multipliers allowed here, which is a great idea because of all the infected everywhere. They actually melt them down and give them pendants instead. Bruh. Meanwhile, back at Graceland 2 Electric Boogaloo, a dude with a monster truck has arrived. They have a nice discussion about using Nevada's driveway, as we now see the similarities between the groups. Albuquerque and Flagstaff are essentially Tallahassee and Columbus. Rules and commandments. They say that they are headed out to the mountains, but then ran into what they call bolts out on the plains. These infected are much stronger and athletic as they have to run down their prey and do not get as many chances at it. Hence the infected chasing the car back to Babylon. Group 1 calls them T-800s as mentioned earlier and they are pushing east as they are running out of food. As the group talks and drinks, there's a few T-800s that have followed them back. Albuquerque and Flagstaff then head out there to deal with the infected. As they appear to deal with them, uh, they then head back inside and they spot a bite mark on Albuquerque's arm. As he says it's just a tattoo, nobody really believes him, and he begins turning right in front of them. He starts puking as Kirk then tells on Flagstaff that he was bit twice, and he starts throwing up too. He immediately changes as they are way stronger than normal. Interesting as this denotes an actual strain of prion that requires you to be infected in this way, seeing as they are stronger than normal. Again, only brain shots appear to actually put them down. Dealing with these two, they now then head out to Babylon to go get Little Rock because the T-800s are heading towards them. Tallahassee goes to get the monster truck and immediately breaks the vehicle as both cars are ruined at this point. Once again, back to the trusty minivan of masculinity. As they drive along, they spot the circus vehicle from earlier and Madison is alive once more. They pick her up as she tells them that she has a nut allergy and she wasn't actually infected and she actually had an EpiPen in her suitcase. As they drive, they discuss where they should actually go and an island conversation kind of comes up, which is actually a good idea. Why not move to an island? The next morning, they finally arrive at Babylon. Tallahassee then burns the boats by tossing a concussive force detonator into the minivan as they then turn over their handhelds to gain entry. 
finding a drum circle, literally, they find Little Rock as well as Berkeley. Madison wants to stay there, but the rest of the squad doesn't really fit in. So Little Rock returns to the drum circle like a huge hippie as Tallahassee begins to hear the call of the buffalo and wants to head out. Tallahassee then gets a truck and leaves on his own, but then runs into a T-800, like literally runs into it, and an entire pack of them as they're headed towards Babylon. He begins his drive back as the group then starts lighting fireworks. How they have survived this long is well beyond me. <laughs> Tallahassee tells them to shut off the fireworks, but it's way too late for that. Little Rock then breaks up with Berkeley on the spot as they decide they need to somehow fight these things. The plan is to basically burn these things and block them in. The fireworks go off, saying that the infected are inbound as the plan officially starts. So this uh, kind of goes the same way as Pacific Playland, except there's no force multipliers. Instead, it's just some good old fashioned hand to hand combat. Before they are horribly mangled, however, Nevada then shows up with a monster truck to rescue them because they got backed into a corner. What timing? However, ultimately, uh, they end up flipping it and then heading back to the hippie compound as they finally get the hippies to do something with impeccable aim, they start throwing stuff. Running up the staircase, it's my worst nightmare. Climbing several stories being chased. As they run through, the infected then continue their chase and they're able to funnel them off of the building as they start chasing Tallahassee. Catching a hook, he's able to survive, <laughs> bro, not a good time. Little Rock is able to dome one of the infected before it's able to pull Tallahassee to his doom, so he ends up surviving. Wichita now tells Columbus that she will marry him, so think of Madison like a bachelor party as she nopes out of there, and I imagine then goes just hangs out with Berkeley. Tallahassee then hooks up with Nevada as everyone but Little Rock actually gets someone. Woof. And then a homer shows up and falls off the edge. The squad then head home, wherever that may be. And that concludes Double Tap. Didn't feel like it went anywhere? Well, you're right. Also at the very ending, Al Roker is apparently infected as Bill then takes him out with a chair and the infection has officially started. I hate Mondays. That was a lot of summarizing. So I think the first thing that we need to cover is the actual disease itself that appears to be afflicting people and then move on to how this would ultimately affect durability and ability for the body to survive well beyond what it should be capable of and then get into like the preservation of intelligence seen in some individuals versus the complete degradation down to almost a trance uh, should something go across their field of view. The first thing to understand about this disease, Breon specifically, is the implications of it are horrifying. Again, this was not a virus, but a variant of mad cow disease that was able to remain relatively undetected as it entered the food industry and then was disseminated into the food that we eat. Now, the only issue with this is the modern United States uh, has rules and regulations in place that would prevent this from happening. You see, around 1986 in the United Kingdom, an outbreak of mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy would break through into the food industry as tainted meat was consumed by many people. The ultimate result of this outbreak was a 100% mortality rate, destroying brains due to encephalopathy, and a question on most medical documentation asking if you've ever been to the United Kingdom during this time frame. The reason that prion disease was allowed to propagate is because at the time the cows were being fed ground up cows. Over time, one single genetic disorder induced by mutations specifically on chromosome 20, well at least in humans anyways, on cows it's a different chromosome, but this usually isn't a problem because a lot of animals are not regularly engaging in cannibalism. Like if you have the chromosomal mutation that will cause you to develop prion disease, Typically, nobody's eating you, so it doesn't get passed along, but it can be passed along basically through sperm or egg, depending on where you got it from in your parent, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is that as long as nobody eats you, that prion disease will not be passed along, but if you do reproduce, it may be passed along as the mutation. But to beef up nutrition, literally cows and cow parts would be ground up and fed to other cows, which allowed for this gene mutation to be propagated in other bovines, which led to a larger scale outbreak. Now, when I say gene mutation, I don't mean the, the cow eating the other cow's genes were changed, but the mutations brought on by the genes of the cow being eaten were then propagated because the prions got into that cow's brain. But this would, again, lead to a larger scale outbreak. Now, the reason this does not happen in the United States and would not take place under the same circumstances is because back in 1997, we banned cows being fed to other cows. Now... Farmers could technically still be doing that. I mean, it's totally possible, but the more regulation and oversight, this has virtually eliminated the chance of a similar outbreak taking place in our fast food joints over here. Factor's looking better and better, isn't it? Use code Roanoke for fit. So all open and shut, isn't it? 
Well, not exactly. In fact, there is something new to fear that seems to have fallen out of limelight as of late, but Papa Roanoke is here to remind you that the planet we live on is both beautiful and horrifying at the same time. There is currently a form of this disease that has been spreading from the West from, for like quite some time, and measures to stop it had to be put into place to make sure it doesn't become too much of a problem. However, it is becoming a problem, so strap in. Chronic Wasting Disease, or CWD, is a form of prion disease that is associated with wild deer populations out near the Rockies. It appears to be spreading as well. Now, we have hunters out there that are taking out deer that look like they're acting strange, but how can they be everywhere at once? That's right, they can't. The problem isn't just so much these deer, but the remains of them that are also becoming something that is fairly alarming, and that's due to the prion durability itself, but we will get there momentarily. With CWD, the deer will become uncoordinated in their movements. They will wander listlessly and into human areas where typically they would be afraid of human activity. Now, I say typically because deer can be exposed to so many humans, that's really no longer an issue. I mean, where I live, it's a protected area, like there's no hunting, and we have so many deer that you can basically just walk up on them and they don't do anything. And I'll tell you what, if the apocalypse happens, I'm going to be eating venison for quite a while because all I got to do is just walk up to them. Uh, so anyways, moving on past that, the disturbing part is that wild deer, as in they haven't been around humans at all, are starting to show up in human areas with this disease. So the issue arises when these deer that can no longer recognize a threat like a bear or a car come into contact with either near something, something important like a farm. Because believe it or not, there are also like a lot of wide open fields with a lot of cows in these areas. As the deer succumbs to some sort of wound, if it happens to be in the enclosure of cows, this could prove to be disastrous once more for the meat industry. Now, let me stop here before getting too deep into this and say, I'm still going to eat steak and burgers because both are delicious. And I'm not gonna lie to you, something out there is gonna kill us all. It's just how life works and I'm not giving up meat. But should this deer drop, and with the current understanding that we have about CWD being that we don't really know if it can jump species or not, which is why hunters are warned not to eat their kills if the animal is acting strange, it's sort of an interesting problem, I guess you could say. Would CWD jump to cows? I mean, we have seen mad cow disease jump to humans, so it does seem completely possible, and they are warning that this potential prion well, it's not really a potential prion. This disease that's actually in deer could potentially jump to humans. Now, you might be thinking, okay, but why would a cow actually eat around like a dead deer? Well, that's the horrible durability of the prion itself. They are incredibly difficult to destroy. One of the concerning things that we have found is that when you leave a prion out in the sun, nothing happens. Like, if you put a bacteria in direct UV light, it could take it out. Viruses, same thing. It, like, deactivates them. But... Prions, they just sit there and they'll remain in the soil until plants from underneath grow, which then it's carried upward, which then it can be eaten by a cow long after the deer carcass has been removed. I'm talking about like months here that a prion can just sit. And that's because prions are not alive. Think of it like an inanimate object, which let's discuss that for a moment. Now that the connection has been made as to how this mad cow disease could have skirted around regulations that we have in place currently. So the question on your mind at this point is like, all right, Roanoke, now that I'm sufficiently horrified about this disease, what is it? Well, you know Papa Roanoke ain't gonna let you down. The first thing is you really shouldn't concern yourself with worrying about it. I know in the face of what I just said, that seems a little strange, but despite it having a 100% lethality rate, the reality is a prion disease is exceedingly rare. The point is, is that if you have like somehow contracted it or developed it through genetic mutations, it kind of seems like there was a target on your back already because you're talking about like a one in million chance of coming into contact with this disease at all and then it actually getting a foothold in your body, further lowering those odds. But the general vector is going to be infected meat, which is heavily scrutinized in today's society with a massive amount of regulations preventing it. The prion disease itself, as mentioned, has no cure, no treatments to ease the effects and no way to save you once it begins. And it's because of how deceptively simple the infection is. The prion itself is nothing more than a misfolded protein. The protein is so stable that things like proteases cannot break it down, which is essentially an enzyme whose whole job is to literally break down proteins. Exposure to air will not denature it. Alcohol does not change its folding. And even an autoclave that literally gets up to 250 degrees, or I think it's like 121 degrees Celsius, for 30 to 60 minutes and uses steam pressure to basically denature and destroy bacteria, viruses, parasites, even that cannot destroy a prion. 
The shape that it has is incredibly durable, but it gets worse because obviously it's not alive, so how does it replicate? Again, it's about as bad as you think because it involves you and basically a conversion of you. In the brain are delicate cells known as neurons. Mind-blowing, I know, right? But on these neurons exist naturally occurring prions that are folded to the correct shape. Now, typically they participate in several biological processes such as neurogenesis, neuronal homeostasis, cell signaling, cell adhesion, and also engage in a protective role when it comes to stress. And that part is going to be very important later. So they carry out these functions quite effectively, so you could think of them as almost like companion proteins to the neurons. When coming into contact with a foreign prion that has been affected by the misfolding process, there are generally two accepted hypotheses that explain what happens during this process. The first process is that the foreign prions come into contact with the normal prions themselves, which causes them to denature and then fold into the new protein structure. Upon doing so, the body can no longer break down their structuring, which then leads to the newly formed prions to go to the next prion and then change its shape as a runaway effect begins. They also tend to clump together at this point, which then can choke out neurons and shorten the dendritic spines and then put pressure on the neurons, which also will end up killing them. The other possibility is, is that these misfolded proteins come into contact with the proteases responsible for folding the normal prions, and it essentially breaks this mechanism, forcing it to take on the shape of the misfolded protein and that it has, which will then go around altering the normal prions into this detrimental variant. Either way, proteins being the basis for cells and conducting many day-to-day -day activities in the body, this being altered will have some pretty profound effects further up the chain. As the prions continue to build up in the brain, this would begin to cause the brain to develop visible holes of missing neuronal tissue as those cells have been killed off. And at this point, the person would begin to devolve in cognitive ability with no way to slow it down. Essentially, what is happening is a traumatic brain injury induced by these rogue proteins. Within roughly 6 to 12 months after this encephalopathy begins, it is usually fatal due to the brain swelling associated with the infection as well as degradation of the connections, which can begin hitting critical areas because if you get prions in your brainstem, it's lights out, bro. But this is a horror biology channel, so you know it's worse than that. Prions aren't always as fast acting as everyone thinks. Some have been known to lurk quietly in the brain for up to 30 years before symptoms of this disease finally make an appearance. And after that, the person expires, or if it's an animal, the prions can remain viable for several years in the open air, exposed to sunlight, because animals don't bury uh, their actual dead. So now we have a firm understanding of how horrible prions actually are, but how does this explain the infected that we have seen? Well, to answer that, the concept we need to operate off of is adaptation. The infected are by no means expired and are still alive in there, just severely altered. Because of that, this would mean they are absolutely going to play by the same rules the rest of us have to, to survive. The lucky, smart, and fast survive. The dumb, slow, and unlucky will succumb and shuffle off their mortal coil, which is really more of a blessing than a curse at that point. The second concept we have to go with is that the disease will affect people differently and given prions ability to lie and wait for several decades before manifesting and any visible symptoms shows that there may be a variance amongst the infected either due to their naturally occurring body or the prion itself. I'm inclined to believe it's the prion itself due to the T800s passing along their durability. So starting with the Homer first, to me, this is clearly an example of someone, while maybe not lucky in their uninfected life because they got infected, they may have been lucky in their infected life relative to their condition. A Homer probably is not from a city and may have been from the suburbs mainly. Their infection led to spongification of the brain to the point that it became essentially a severe mental disability. The prion infection itself does not cause a person to want to eat another person, but instead would cause their brain to swell, altering behavior, and likely leading back to the need to consume anything, and with people running around, well, eventually they would take a bite. The Homer being in a suburban area likely had to contend with less population density and chaos as the infection continued to ransack his brain. His cerebrum would likely be heavily affected, specifically the frontal lobe and hypothalamus area, leading to what we see. Someone who cannot really think, plan, or possibly even really feel hungry, which has apparently subdued their hunter instincts, or specifically survival instincts, which has led them to sort of wander and get sidetracked easily, leading to survivors not really being scared about them. The opposite of this is the hawking. The hawking shows that potentially there is a combination of what form of prion you're infected with is important along with how the brain operated. 
This may imply that the dense connections of the cerebrum to begin with may have an impact on how the prions affect them. The Hawking is someone who was highly intelligent to begin with, and after their infection, they could retain some of this intelligence. Now, it's also possible this variant was just newly infected, and as a result, the brain hadn't really been subdued as quickly, allowing them to still think, which we will get into how the prions cause the symptoms here in a moment, but it's possible that the brain has also been infected for quite some time, just to point that out, but specific areas with planning, again, the frontal lobe, have been spared to a degree. But some certain portions, because of emotional balance, memories, and control of oneself, those would have to be destroyed because they're situated in the same lobe, and if they were fully intact, then it's likely this person would not be so keen on eating another person. But no matter what the process is, it appears the prions will spare some of the brain tissue and because of the more densely connected brain tissue leading to a more intelligent person in their uninfected life, it may be that the prions have a harder time moving as effectively in this area. But regardless, the outcome is the same. While somewhat diminished, intellect was above normal for an infected and well beyond that of a homer. The third variant is a ninja. Ninjas likely developed in cities or communities that were deep within the woods. Essentially, these would be the ones that survived by not making a lot of sound and staying out of sight and being ambush predators. And with all these variants, it shows that there still is a bit of a human element within them. Humans, being persistent hunters, would a lot of times coordinate with the rest of the group to run prey towards them, where they would then ambush the prey and take it out. This has persisted into this variant, who will still stick to the shadows and out of sight before launching their ambush attack. This would involve a very old portion of the brain concerning hunting techniques and survival, which is basically called the lizard brain. Um, it's just the oldest portion of the brain. There's been discussion about if the lizard mammalian primate brain is really a thing. I believe what they're trying to say with that is there's older portions of your brains, like the pons, the medulla, and the brainstem. And then there's newer portions of the brain, which is the cerebrum, because that was the last to really grow on humans. So just take that with a grain of salt. But it seems that those who are infected in this process, the frontal lobe is spared somewhat as well, though there is clearly damage to it. But unlike many others who have ungainly movement that seems disjointed, even the Hawkings, the cerebellum may have been completely spared in the ninjas, allowing them to be fast and agile when taking down non-infected. And the last version that is an incredibly recent occurrence are known as the T-800s. These type of infected are different for an extremely likely scenario that the environment played a huge role, as well as the prions themselves, and the human body's ability to heal, kind of, you know, being an after effect. But let's start with the environment first and work our way through. The T-800s come from the plains of the United States near the Rockies. Now, I don't know if you've been out there before, but it's basically going to open them up to nowhere to hide and vast distances to cover if they want to eat. Because remember, these infected are still alive, and as a result, they need incoming energy in order to survive, and likely still do feel hunger. As many would be picked off from hundreds of yards away, this in turn would leave the most intelligent that knew how to duck, or the most durable. Over time, this would create a variant that due to its environment, would be highly athletic as their bodies would be sculpted by running around the plains. And only those who were smart enough to move around quickly, or duck, would be left, meaning that those would be the methods that they would employ later to stay alive. As the years continue to pass, another factor would come into play that likely impacts all variants that have begun to change. When the prion disease didn't outright spongify their brains leading to their end, this allowed for the brain to undergo a somewhat adaptive repair process. Known as neuroplasticity, this is essentially the process of forming new connections in the brain and remapping older areas to take on new traits as well as undergoing neurogenesis. This process is incredibly slow, but when it takes place over enough time, this can potentially lead to things like spontaneous recovery of lost functions due to brain damage, although complete recovery from brain damage should be noted to be exceedingly rare. One of the important things to note about this process is that the prions, as mentioned earlier, help facilitate neurogenesis to some degree. I believe once infected with this new prion, those that do not get outright bodied have their bodies adapt to the new prions to a degree, and the standard processes continue on after a couple of years. This could explain why, at first, all the infected are the same. They have the same intellect, same movement, and same goals. But as time passes and their bodies adapt to this new disease, or don't adapt, outliers begin to form until this results in a new variant in general, which then can lead to the T-800s. But how does this explain their physical ability? I mean, they could take a shot to the dome, body, wherever, and then just keep coming as long as they can move. Well, it appears that, as mentioned, with the prions working to alter the brain and the brain subsequently adapting to the infection, the prions may influence the speed 
at which neuroplasticity takes place. Prions facilitating this process and those being affected may help to explain this given the metric of how quickly the brain itself is overtaken when initially infected. When Albuquerque and Flagstaff are infected, we see that just within a few minutes after the bite, the prions had traveled up to the brain and began altering by putting pressure on the brain and then basically making the initial infected form. Because you can also be bitten and infected, this would imply most of the body itself may be actually affected by the prion disease, or at minimum, the salivary glands are actually uh, producing these prions, or the prions are going through them. Either way, this process is incredibly fast, uh, and it's unsurprising that it would have taken over the planet, but it gives us a clue as to why the T-800s are so powerful. After the prions move to the brain and minutes pass, some of the brain is destroyed and some of it is spared. Given enough time, Flagstaff would have likely evolved into a Hawking and Albuquerque would have probably turned into a ninja due to his survival and fighting ability. However, because being bitten by the T-800s themselves, it also appears that they're more durable than normal as well, indicating that this line of prions arose from different circumstances. You know, like natural adaptation and it being the most successful in its environment. It's all related to biology. Haha, <laughs> yeah, okay, anyways. Nerding out aside, the T-800s seem to have more influence in not just the central nervous system, but the peripheral nervous system as well, and as such, the motor neurons and sensory neurons, though it hasn't really been seen with the sensory neurons. But the motor neurons, this is what gives them the durability, and it's related to the altered prions being more stable than normal prions, and this may somehow stabilize motor neurons as well from things like physical damage. So a piece of lead flying through the body would typically cause a compressional wave through said body that would rip apart neural connections, rendering a limb or even an entire portion of the body useless as the body had its link severed to that area. Prions seem to almost bolster this connection, meaning the only way to actually stop it is to destroy the brain entirely or hit the nerve directly. And this is what we see in the RV area when the infected takes several rounds and as long as the spine was still connected, it will continue to move until the blurred out brain then gets decimated. This reinforcement of neurons would take quite a bit of time and may operate in a form of a prion sheath. Because remember, prions typically reside outside of the neuron and are limited in numbers though. But when this new prion circulates around, it may be that it recruits other protein structures or in general forces the body to overproduce these new prions. Once this happens, the neuron is then potentially coated in a protective protein layer of these things that may even work to encase the synaptic gap between neurons to further increase the strength of the system overall. This could also be because as they eat others, other natural prions are then ingested and potentially utilized as well, though it's kind of unlikely, but you can get prion disease from eating tainted meat. So if you eat another individual who has prions, potentially you could take those as well. But again, this is a little more far-fetched. So essentially with the T-800s, it becomes less about shocking the body and letting them bleed out like you can do with most of the other infected, and it becomes more about destroying a bolstered nervous system to put it down quickly, as even with severe damage, the infected can stay alive for an extended period of time, which would ultimately lead to your infection as well. The prion is a horrifying protein disease that as a species, we don't really understand all too well at this point. But what we do know about it is that if it were to get out of hand, it likely wouldn't result in zombies in really any capacity, but a lot of graveyards being filled up. In Zombieland, however, these infected would adapt to the disease over the years to become stronger than they once were, indicating that not only does the disease itself not have a 100% mortality rate, but actually just has a 100% infectivity rate, but the body can also contend somewhat. And this may imply that given another 10 years, the body may further recover depending on the age of the infected and that those infected can actually still reproduce because there's nothing that says that they're not actually still fertile. So would the prions actually be passed down to the infected? Uh, uh, would they be somewhat human? Like in the movie, The Girl with All the Gifts, which I actually did a video over that if you want to see it. Uh, it's not really known, but for now, we won't know until we get the third installment of Zombieland that is probably coming out in 2029 or something which alarmingly isn't really that far off.